Hello, Sampson County. Uh, my name is Parker Holland. I'm a security and support technician with the North Carolina State Board of Elections for District 5, which includes the wonderful Sampson County Board of Elections Office. Uh, first off, I want to say thank you for your service and your time. Uh, I know this is a time-consuming event, whether it's training or whether it's election day or if it's early voting. Working elections is a commitment and I thank you for it. Um, as you can see, I've started wearing my mask, but as we go through training and right now, I'm going to take it off um, so that way you can hear me better. But it's just a reminder that masks are required for precinct workers. Um, again, thank you so much for your time and commitment and we'll get started with training. Hello, I'm Naya Rayner, the Interim Director for Sepsic County Board of Elections. Thank you for taking time out of your day to be here with us today, and thank you for working with us. I know times are different, um, but we will work through it. This is Sampson County Election Official Training. I want to thank you for being here again. First off, the central principles. Election officials must administer election laws, rules, and policies. That's your number one responsibility, be consistent and be uniformed. Elections officials must also facilitate a process where ballots cast by qualified and eligible voters will be counted. Election officials must facilitate process where if the qualifications or eligibility of a voter is in question, the person will not be able to cast a ballot that will be improperly counted. We have a dual role to ensure that every qualified and eligible voter can, without delay, cast a ballot that will be counted and to ensure that voters who are not qualified or eligible to vote do not cast a ballot that will be improperly counted. That is the principle that goes to the heart of election integrity. The final decision of whether to count a ballot of a voter whose qualifications or eligibility is in question is a matter for the members of the County Board of Elections. The role of the voting site officials is to put qualified and eligible voters in the best position to ensure their ballot will be counted and provided, provide County Board members with the best information to ensure that they make the proper decision under the law. Do not turn anyone away, please. General rules for precinct officials. All workers must take an oath. Also, they cannot be related to candidates and workers um, will not be in the same, if you are related to someone, you will not be working in the same polling site, like a wife, husband, mother, father, brother or sister cannot work in the same precinct together or child. Also, chief judges and judges will remain all day and if a precinct official leaves the polling place, they cannot return. Remember, must you all must remain nonpartisan. We are in the work in process. We're not about politics. All workers was, must be nonpartisan at all times. No newspapers or people magazines with a candidate on the front. You must not be only nonpartisan, but you must meet a high standard of not appearing partisan in any way. The appearance as well, the reality of care efficiency, impartiality, and honest election administration. Supply pickup. There is a checklist. We will provide um, chief judges with a checklist. It might not look like the one um, that we'll provide, but we will go over with the chief judges. We also um, will pack supplies to make sure and double check at our Sampson County Board of Elections. Please be patient when you're picking up the supplies. Um, the final chance to ask us any questions is here, but they'll also remember you'll be able to contact us um, and we'll give you our contact information. Chief judges, um, you'll pick up the supplies on Monday morning and that's when we'll go over everything. If you have any more questions, if um, you've already contact your um, official um, poll workers um, and if they have any questions they can contact us and we'll answer any questions or concerns before election day but we'll also be able to contact us with any problems or emergencies or concerns or questions on election day also. 
You'll also note that you'll pick up your ballot styles um, when you're picking up your supplies. Um, it comes with a reconcile sheet. It might appear different than on screen, but um, each night you, during election day, you'll be reconciling and making sure your numbers match, especially at the end of the night also. Let's talk about voting sites. Um, you have some best practices when it comes to your polling locations and their layout. You want to ensure that you have accessibility standards for entering and exiting. You want to make sure that anyone can easily move in the voting site. You must have an accessible voting booth and your auto mark must be on and ready. You also need to make sure that you have signage and we're going to talk a little bit about that in just a minute. And we're going to uh, want to remind you all that your tabulators should be near the exit and that your equipment and furniture uh, that must be visible from the public, it, it needs to make sure, if it must be visible, it needs to be sure that it's not in the way from them. You want to remember that especially in this time of COVID, that should a line form at a check-in station, there is room and it won't impede traffic, cause people to be standing in a doorway and blocking traffic. Again, with COVID, you want to ensure that any lines within the enclosure do not cross. You also want to make sure that booths are spread six feet apart and that they ensure voter privacy. You need to make sure that election uh, officials can make clean out the voting booths. Um, and you also want to make sure that you have enough voting booths. Cannot stress that enough. Let's talk a little bit about signs. As voters wait in line and go from one station to another, there must be signage to direct and inform them. Voting site stations and illustrated signage are nothing new. You've been doing it for years in Sampson County. But the effective use of these simple concepts are key to providing a voting process that is fully compliant with North Carolina law, it's uniform statewide, and ultimately fair to the voters and election integrity. An example of one of your signs is no voters beyond this point and having a error directing where to go. And you also have a checklist for it. Please remember to use your checklist. And this does not pertain just to signs, but all throughout elections administration. The sign on your screen right now says no photo ID required. This is a reminder that the sign is to inform voters that photo ID is not required to vote in this election. As Jerry will talk about later on, there are certain instances where voters will have to show an ID, but it's not the strict photo ID or the uh, photo ID requirement that had been previously approved um, back in 2018. You also want to have this sign. I know these signs are probably still in your DS200s. When I was down here doing LNA testing, I saw them. You just want to remember that uh, and it, to remind the voters to view it so that way they will hopefully review each selection on their ballot before inserting it into the tabulator. All right, you want to continue to post your eligibility signs. This sign is to assist voters in understanding what they are signing when they sign their vote authorization document. This relates back to uh, authorization to vote checkboxes. Essentially, we're informing everyone about the requirements to sign their authorization to vote form, and again, we'll discuss this later on. Let's talk about what we're going to do on election morning. The first thing you're going to want to do is turn on the tabulator. This way, if there are issues, you have time to contact the County Board of Elections Office for assistance. The auto mark, which is on the right-hand corner of the screen, is used by voters who are visually impaired, unable to read a ballot, have trouble holding a pen in order to mark their ballot. It should be turned on as well. Curbside should have been tested during setup, but you want to make sure you turn it on so that way it's working properly. And if not, you can call the Board of Elections. Do not use an accessible space for curbside. Accessible spaces should be kept for those voters who do have an accessibility issue but would like to park and enter the voting enclosure. Curbside should also have a marked buffer zone. Please mark the curbside voting area with proper and easily visible signage. Your county may also find it helpful to propose signage that prohibits electioneering in that area. 
We've seen this all throughout the state that um, the, the signage for the curbside area is very, very helpful. If a voting location cannot accommodate the 50 or 25 curbside voting buffer, a reasonable boundary should be established to ensure the curbside area remains free of electioneering. And here's a great model of the buffer zone up on the screen. Your final morning election prep. You want to remember to discuss emergency procedures. Make sure you have an evacuation plan for people in bouts and have any emergency numbers ready. You can also see where we've said to mark any additional absentee voters in the registration list. You will do that in EVID and the emergency poll book. You want to highlight any voters in the poll book listed as having voted absentee so that they are more visible for a team at check-in. Voters who return their ballots after the poll books were printed will not be marked as voted in the poll book, so you'll want to make sure that these are marked clearly. Please make sure that your phone is working for incoming and outcoming calls. And as it says, teamwork makes the dream work. Work together so you can have everything up and running smoothly before the first voter arrives. Let's talk about election day, the big day, November 3rd. Your check-in station. This is your first stop for the voter. Most of the process steps are processes you've been doing for years, but let's go through the check-in steps together. You have the voter greeting. You have the name review. You have the address review. You have the voter status review. You have the party affiliation review, which is only in a partisan primary, so we will not be doing that this year. And then you have the determination, eligibility, and voting authorization. Remember, nowhere in this list does it say to ask a voter, every voter, excuse me, for photo ID. Remember that court order, um, by court order, voters are not required to show a photo ID to vote. Now let's talk about the voter greeting. Determine if the voter needs assistance. If the voter is with another person, you can start the script. If a voter needs assistance, it must be requested. If a voter is accompanied when presenting to vote, an election official must determine if the voter wants assistance from that person. The voter may also ask for assistance from an election official. There is a script to follow. We tend to think in terms of physical disabilities, but not all disabilities are immediately apparent. But a voter who requires assistance entering the voting booth or marking a ballot due to a mental disability is just as entitled to assistance as a voter whose disability may be easily seen. You may pose yes or no questions and may allow the voter to point out the person they want to assist them. You should follow the provided voter assistance script. When following this script, please do not, do not ask the voter to explain or identify the nature of their disability. Not all voters are able to communicate their preferences verbally. It is appropriate to modify the script in such situations to accept a written response and nod uh, or other indicator from the voter. This script again will be provided to you by the elections office. Let's talk about the name review. Ask for the voter's name. A voter must state their name when presenting to vote in person. The materials provided will include issues you might encounter, such as a voter is unable or unwilling to state their name. If a voter is unable to state their name, they may write their name. A voter who is unable to state or write their name may receive assistance in doing so. If a voter refuses to state their name, check-in will arrange for the voter to speak with the chief judge. You want to search for the name on the voter record. The election official should next search for the voter's name in the poll book or use uh, an EVID, or if we have to go to labels, they'll search for it on the labels. When searching for a voter on the voter list, election officials should be aware that there may be more than one voter with that same or a similar name. Before determining that the correct voter is located, an official must be sure to check the middle name or check for any junior or senior designation. 
If more information is required to determine the correct voter record, it is okay for the election official to ask the voter to provide a date of birth. If the voter's name cannot be located on the voter list, here are a few suggestions. Ask the voter to spell their name. Ask a voter if their name has changed. Ask a voter if their name is hyphenated. You can, in the EBIT system, just type in the first three letters that you're able to hear. You can perform a search by date of birth. You can perform a search by a voter's residential address as well. Name review. Compare the stated name to the name on the voter record. If the name stated does not match the name on the record, try the following. Ask the voter if their name has changed. Confirm there is not a reasonable variation in the name stated and the name on the record. If the voter's name on the record is not current, update the voter's name. The voter must sign the appropriate section on the authorization document or the change of a name of address form for the County Board of Elections to process the name change. Step 3 is the address review. A voter must give their legal voting residence. A voter's, vote, a voter's legal voting residence is the address where the voter will have resided for at least 30 days as of, as of the date of the election. If the address on the voter record is different than the stated address, confirm that you pulled up the correct voter record according to the voter's name. If you have the correct voter record, ask the voter if they have moved. If the voter indicates they have moved, ask a voter for their previous address. If the previous address matches the address in the voter's record, ask the, voters for the, ask the voter for the date of the move. If the date of the move is less than 30 days before election day, the voter is eligible to vote based on the previous address. If the date of the move is 30 days or more before election day, follow the unreported move procedures. Remember, this date for this year for which you have to move by is October 4th. If there is an address issue that cannot be resolved, a voter will be offered a provisional voting option. At this point, you will complete a referral form and refer the voter to the help station. Step 4 is Voter Status Review. Determine whether there are voter status issues that need to be resolved before a ballot can be issued. Here are some status issues that you may encounter. Some can be resolved at the check-in station, however, others will require that you send the voter to the help station for additional assistance. Active means that a voter is registered to vote in a county and there are no known issues. The voter, an inactive voter is a voter who is registered to vote in the county, but the County Board of Elections is unsure of their correct physical or mailing address. Uh, Jerry will show you how to work with an inactive voter in the electronic poll book system. He's also going to talk about an ID required voter. An ID required designation indicates that this is a first time voter who at the time of their initial registration did not provide verifiable identification. The requirement for first time voters to show identification is a requirement of the Help America Vote Act of 2002, also known as HAVA. Again, this is a separate requirement from the North Carolina Photo ID. Acceptable forms of a HAVA ID include a current and valid unexpired photo identification or a copy of one of the following documents that state the name and address of a voter, a current utility bill, a bank statement, a government check, a paycheck, or other government document. Remember that these documents can be electronic so long as they are uh, from the original source. Other things you might see are absentee already voted, and Jerry's going to show you how you can recognize that in the EBID system. If the record indicates that the voter has already cast a ballot, the election official should reconfirm that the correct voter has been located on the voter list. A removed voter is when a, no, a voter is no longer considered to be registered to vote in the county. And a denied voter is, a, is when a voter registration applicant was deemed not qualified to vote by the County Board of Elections. Those voters may only vote a provisional ballot. No ballot, you may see, will have uh, eligibility factors uh, such as residence, age, and partisan affiliation, and that is typically only in a party primary. 
let's talk about your authorization to vote form. Now the one that you're going to see for even looks a little bit different, but if you have to go to backup labels, it'll look very similar to this. An authorization to vote is a voter's ticket to receive a ballot, but the first check-in station must confirm eligibility. Let's review the ATV form. Section A includes both the voter's information from the poll book and the voter's certification of voting qualifications. It has the, um, the ATV label, HAVA ID types, voter certification, and signature of the voter and the election officials. Section B um, is your election day transfer. This section will be used as the exceptions, at the exceptions table, not the registration table. It would be completed if you need to transfer a voter to a different precinct. Again, we'll discuss that under the exceptions help table or the help table uh, later on. You also have the curbside affidavit. This section is used for curbside voters. We will discuss this as well later on. Now, you have a plan for in the event that the power goes out. You want to be sure that you're familiar with this. You will have backup labels that are sent to you if the computers can no longer be used. On the left side, you'll have the voter's name and information. On the right side, you will have that as well, but there's a distinct difference. You'll have a barcode. The left side remains in the poll book. The right side is placed on the ATV. Also at the bottom of the screen here, if somebody has voted absentee, you get a nice uh, big view um, that states that the voters already voted absentee. The label on the right hand side will go on the uh, authorization to vote form where it says place ATV label here. If you have an ID required designation, um, the labels will also inform you of this. And you can see in the bottom left hand corner it will say ID required. If a person has one of the eligible forms of HAVA ID, then you can process that voter for, uh, as a perfect scenario voter. If a person does not have one of the eligible forms of ID, you would direct them to the help station where they will vote a provisional ballot. The voter will need to present an eligible form of HAVA ID before Canvas. Please provide the voter with a copy of the notice to voters with no acceptable ID. Notice that within the label system, um, you will see a verify address on the label and there will be no ballot style listed. The reason there is no ballot style is because we aren't sure where the voter resides and their ballot is dependent on their eligible voting address. Remember, this does not require any paperwork or ID. You simply ask the person to confirm their address. This may require the voter to be transferred, and if it does, use the change of name or updated address form to update. Be sure to mark on the ATV that there is an update. A help referral form. If you are sending a person to the help station, you will use the help referral form to go with their ATV. The form is meant to assist the official in identifying the issue with the voter. There's a manual option or the form will, prevent, or will print from the electronic poll book. Let's talk about the determination of voter eligibility and voter authorization. This is where you make a final determination of the voter's qualification eligibility and you will provide the ATV form. At this point, you're going to state the voter's name and residential address if you find the voter is qualified and eligible to vote. Then you're going to issue an ATV document. The election official must review key elements on the form with the voter. The name, the address, the party affiliation and ballot preferences in a primary only. Again, we will not do that in this step, in this year, and the voter eligibility statements. 
the election official again must review this information with the voter. The ballot station. Once you have confirmed that the voter's eligibility to receive a, the voter's eligibility to receive a ballot, you will send them to the ballot station. At the ballot station, make sure you have um, your checklist. Ensure that forms are available, including the spool ballot log, the tabulator ATV mat sheet, the 10 to enforce sheet. Please remember to keep your ballots secure and orderly. Your best practice is to assign two or more people if there's more than one ballot style in a polling location. At the ballot station, you want to make sure the first thing you do when setting it up is to know which ballot styles should be available in your precinct and compare with the ballots you were issued to ensure you have all types. So really and truly, know your ballot styles. Keep your ballot secure and organized. Review your ATVs carefully and use your barcode scanner. The steps for the ballot station procedure are listed in this slide and should be reviewed. At the ballot station, after you receive the ATV form, double check to ensure that all the required fields were completed at the check-in station. If an ID required status was um, marked, if the verify address has been completed, did the voter sign, did the check-in station or help station initial. Remember to pull the correct ballot, scan the ballot, scan the ATV, with your uh, scanner, if you have a happy beep, issue the ballot to the voter. If you have an angry beep, make sure again that the correct ballot was pulled. Remember to sequentially number and place the ballots, or place the ATVs in a notebook or on a spindle. And remember when you issue the ballot to the voter to instruct the voter on proper ballot marking and direct them to the booth and remind them that once they are finished, they will place the ballot in the tabulator. At the ballot station, make sure you know your processes for jurisdiction, know how and when to spool a ballot, and always remember that a voter may only have one ballot at a time. When someone makes a mistake on their ballot, like they voted for two candidates in a contest where they can only vote for one, that's when you're gonna wanna spool a ballot. That will probably be the most common thing you'll see throughout the election. If a voter makes a mistake and needs to remark a ballot, remember they cannot have the old ballot and a new ballot in their possession at the same time. ATV management. The health of your precinct is reflected in the completeness and accuracy of your ATVs. Chief judges should flip through their notebooks on a regular basis to ensure all is well. Your match sheet. Ballot station officials should complete every hour or more often. Misnumbering is the mistake that most often occurs, but it is easy to correct if you use your match sheet and dis discover it quickly. If not, you will end up staying an extra hour or more after the polls close trying to figure out why your ATVs and your DS200 do not match. Your curbside station. You have 10 steps for a curbside process. The first is the voter greeting. The second is the name review. The third is your voter status review. The fourth is your address review. The fifth one, which we will not do this year because we are not in a partisan primary, is the partisan affiliation review. Step six is to generate the vote authorization documents. Step seven is to assemble your ballot materials. Step eight is to obtain voter signatures. Step 9 is allow the voter to mark the ballot, and step 10 is to accept the voter's ballot. We will provide this reference for you and to all curbside officials to use as a prompt and a reminder of what they are to do. Let's talk briefly about your curbside overview. Remember that you have a buffer zone. The preference is 25 to 50 feet. If not, a reasonable boundary should be set. Remember, observers may observe at curbside. They can listen for a voter to state their name and address or party. They may not hover close enough to see the voter's ballot choices, and they may not board buses or enter vehicles. Getting started at curbside. 
when heading out to the curbside uh, to assist with curbside voters, you must have the following items, including the curbside log, the quick reference guide, and the pen, and of course, a clipboard or a hard surface. Remember to ask the voter to sign the curbside affidavit, determine if the voter requires assistance, read the, earth, the oath to voters, and complete the curbside log. Assembling your ballot materials. The curbside official must assemble the proper voting materials based on whether the voter is being issued a regular ballot or a provisional ballot as follows, and as you can see on the screen. When issuing a regular uh, ballot, the official would gather the ATV or one-stop application, a privacy sleeve, and a ballot. When issuing a provisional ballot, the voter would get the official would gather for the voter the provisional voting application, a privacy sleeve, a ballot, a provisional envelope, and provisional voter instructions. Completing the curbside process. Review the document or documents with the voter to ensure that the information on the form is correct. Indicate the errors on the relevant forms that require the voter's signatures. You'll want to obtain the signatures and then provide the voter with the voting materials. Allow voters to vote while monitoring curbside from a distance. And finally, you'll want to collect the materials and return to the enclosure with the ballot. And when you return to the enclosure with the ballot, give the chief judge or judge to insert the ballot into the tabulator and return to the car and tell the voter that they have casted their ballot. And now we're going to have Jerry talk about EVID training. He's going to go over a typical voter, updating an address, work with inactive voters, provisional voting, and more. Hi, folks. Jerry Smith here with my mask for COVID. Uh, we're going to talk about EVID, and we're going to go through what we've been doing for the past five years here in Clinton County, in Sampson County, and that's used the electronic voter identification EVID poll book on Election Day. And for this training, I'm going to need to take my mask off so you can hear me, but certainly we'll be wearing, wearing masks and PPE and all that stuff we've been hearing about for, for our COVID protection. I appreciate everybody helping out in this election. Uh, it's going to be interesting, and EVID is going to help everybody, I promise you. Uh, EVID has been very successful here in Sampson County, and I expect nothing less here. Uh, most precincts will have uh, but one machine. Uh, for the voter lookup, some folks will have two. Um, the two machines uh, will get connected by a cable and, uh, and they'll be communicating to each other and, uh, and keep in sync, make sure everything is, is in sync when those two machines are working. And also each machine will have an activator. I'm sure all of you remember one of these flash drives. Each machine will have one of these. Okay, once they're inserted into that machine prior to 6.30, it will stay in that machine all day. The folks that will have the two, it does not matter which machine, which activator goes into which one, but as long as it stays in that one machine all day long. I've never seen a problem get fixed by switching the activators. It would actually cause more of a problem than not. So when you insert the activator, just leave it there all day long. But that will need to be inserted in the machine before you can start the EVID program. Okay. There's a couple of things I want to stress right now up front to make sure you're familiar with the use of EVID and it's going to make your life a lot easier. Especially with the wearing of the masks, you're going to be losing a lot of communication capabilities that you've had. And understanding people is going to be a bit of a challenge because you'll have a mask, you'll probably have a face shield, and you'll probably have some plastic between you and that voter. So understanding a voter is going to be more cumbersome to you. And I want to stress something about EVID that makes it a lot easier to use, and that's the search method for voters. And I certainly want to stress to you that you use the three-character search method to find voters in EVID. By using the first three characters of the first name, space, first three characters of the last name, you will find your voter in the system. I don't want you doing phonetic spelling. I don't want you doing a lot of typing because you'll probably not do it correctly based on not hearing the voter correctly. So if you limit your input to three characters of the first name or th and three characters of the last name, you will find your voter or a very small list to select from. 
If you only use three characters, you'll get the last name. So if you wanted to search for every Smith in the, in the county, SMI. We'll bring a bigger search, but certainly you'll, you'll bring back voters. And we'll go through some of the things that EVID will enable you to better identify the voters to vote them properly. Okay? So the activator is inserted into the machine. Once you get it booted up, okay, I'm going to start this machine so perhaps we can see it on the screen. Okay, this is what the workstation will look like, folks, when you start up. There's not a lot to do in this machine other than even workstation. So you just, with the inserted activator, you just double click on that icon and you'll see the software come up. Now something that's going to happen when you open up EVID, the first thing that's going to happen is it's now printing a blank sheet of paper out of the printer. That's not a bad thing, it's a good thing. It shows that your printer is connected. If you don't get this blank piece of paper, there could be a problem with your connection to the printer. Okay, so that blank piece of paper, you can perhaps re-put that into the stack, but certainly it's a piece of paper that will print. Okay, I want to make another comment. I was just reminded. There'll be a lot of papers printing out of EVID, out of this printer. You do not throw any, any printed piece of paper from that printer away. If you don't know where it goes, put it in some miscellaneous or whatever, but it should all come back to the office. If my system printed it, it probably had a reason. It may not be apparent to you, but it may help us in trying to figure out if there was a problem or something of that nature. So do not throw any piece of paper that prints out. Also, on the bottom of most of the forms that print, there will be a little reminder message on where that document should go, like the ATV binder or the changes folder or something of that nature. It will remind you where that has to go. I'm sure you'll just need that reminder a couple of times until you figure out during the day where this stuff is supposed to go. But one of the bigger challenges that Naya and the staff will have post-election is deciphering all this paperwork. So if we could get it in the right spot, it will certainly make Naya's life a lot easier. Okay, as you look at the familiar screen that you've seen, uh, you'll notice it's the November 2020 election. I want to bring to your attention down at the bottom of the screen, you'll see that precinct identifier. I am in precinct Clinton East. The printed precinct identifier should be the precinct that you're working in. If you notice when you boot up and that precinct is not your precinct, you should call the office immediately. There is remedy we can help you with over the phone to get it right, but you need to make sure that that precinct identifier is correct. As I move to the right at the bottom of that screen, you'll see that yellow sync on one. That means I only have one machine. And most of you folks will only have one machine. So you'll see that yellow sync one message. The folks that have two machines, and if they're connected correctly, that yellow will turn gray and it will say sync on two, which means you've successfully connected the two machines. It's important that in the two machine precincts, and I think there's only a couple of them, like Lakewood and Clinton East, in fact, will have a couple of machines you should see sync on two, and then again, as each vote count goes up, you should see it. Because to the right of there, you'll see that ATV and curbsides. That will be your count of how many ATVs and curbsides you've actually printed, which should translate into a ballot. This is the number you should be checking on a regular, regular basis during the day, no longer than every hour, that you're syncing up your ballot table number, to your tabulator number, to your EVID number. Make sure they all sync because that means we have good audit tabulation. We have everything accounted for. Okay, also we have some statistics here that will be helpful on the phone calls or the information you provide to the office at 10, 2, and 5 o'clock as far as your voter totals. You can get them right here as far as how many people have voted. To the left here, up on the screen, you'll see these reports here. You can't see them now. As soon as we get some data, I'll talk to you quickly about some of those reports. But this is considered what we call the main screen. And the only thing really, well, the two things you can do, but the only thing we're going to do here is sign in. And this is where you would exit. But this is where you do your sign in, folks. You just click on that, and all I need from you are your initials. 
and it's important that anybody working the keyboard that their initials are in the system and I'll show you quickly on how to change operators during the day. We have seen in, in Sampson County people have been signed on for 14 straight hours. I find that amazing because I can't go more than three without having to get up to use the bathroom. So make sure if you're working the keyboard your initials are on the machine because we will timestamp and stamp your initials on all transactions so if Naya and the staff has a question about a specific transaction they may want to ask you. The password for everybody it's very easy and I'm not making light of security but the password is EVID and I am not and never will use this the shift button or capitals in my system you don't need to shift anything you hit the button and now the first of many pieces of paper is printing out of the printer this is called the opening report this report verifies that there's no votes on the system and this document needs to be signed by the chief judge and the two judges it also gets needs to get put in the blue even changes binder as well this is a very important piece of paper much like the zero tape from your tabulator if the machines that have two the precincts that have two machines you'll get two of these print them both sign them both okay and that gets put again at the bottom it says put in even blue changes binder Okay, now obviously you see the voter lookup button is now available. This is where you'll click on the voter lookup. And this is the screen that you'll spend 85 to 95 percent of your day. This is where you're going to find voters either by first name, last name, birth date, or street address. Now I again want to firmly reinforce the three character search method where I just need the first three characters of the first name space the first three characters of their last name. Do not repeat, do not try to phonetically spell people's names out. It will slow you down. I promise you the three character search method is what you want to do. So I'm going to find anybody named John Smith, J-O-H space S-M-I. So six characters and I came up with the five voters in Sampson County that meet that criteria. A very small list to work with okay so that three character method will certainly speed up your process because you'll find voters accurately and efficiently now I basically want to explain what this screen looks like this is a grid screen it can be filled with up to 16 voters we sort the list by last name first name alphabetically you'll notice a couple of things on this screen we have the last name first name we have the voter address, we have their gender, we have their age, we also print their party, which is not important in a primary, we print their status, which is the active, inactive, and you'll see inactives later. We also print their precinct, and in this case you'll see one of the precincts is highlighted. That means they're in my precinct, which is Cl Clinton East. So the precincts that are highlighted in a grid that presents it they are actually in your precinct. More than likely, that's the voter you're looking for. Also, you'll see on remarkably four of these five voters, the letter E in red. That means that these folks have already voted early and will not be able to vote on election day except using a provisional. I suspect this election day you will get a lot of folks coming on the line to try to find out whether the office has accepted their ballot or they've already voted. So you can find that information on any voter in Clinton, in Sampson County by pulling up their name and if they have a red E, if they have a red A, which means absentee, or if they have a red V, which means they voted that day, those voters have already voted and the system will tell you, and you can tell that to the voter, that they've already cast a ballot in this election. But I'll show you a few more examples of that as we go on. Okay? But John Smith here, I'll just pull up his record. And again, if you'll notice, it says he's already voted. And if I click on everything correct with this voter, and it is all correct, the system will tell me, so you can tell the voter, that you have already cast a ballot. The only way you can vote today is a provisional. Do you wish to vote a provisional and you want to recommend that they don't because they've already participated and we have record? But again, if they insist, 
and a provisional ballot should always be available to any voter at any any time but certainly this is a case where you just tell the voter that they've already voted and they should believe you okay so I'm going to get into some searching because we're going to look at some different voter scenarios, okay? And I'm just going to do a general search on the name SMI, Smith, because that's my last name. And I, as you saw very quickly, I pulled up 667 folks in Sampson County that have SMI for their last name. But this grid gives me a little bit more explanation to things I want to show you. Certainly we talked about how the list is displaying alphabetically by last name. Okay, we have a number of folks that have the red E, which means that they voted. Also, I want to bring to your attention the status, which is active for most of those folks, but one person, Alana Smith, is inactive. And to, re to remind folks what an inactive voter is, it may be somewhat obvious that they haven't participated in the election, yes, but more likely the office has tried to mail them something and it's come back what they call undeliverable. Either the P.O. box or their address is no longer valid or it's incorrect. Of every voter that has that inactive status will be eligible to vote on Election Day, but you will have to verify their address. The system will force you to do that, and I'll show you how that works in a minute, okay? So I'm going to just do a quick search again and start and just show you exactly how easy I expect things to be. Because if it's the right voter that shows up in front of you, they have no name changes, they're in the right precincts, I'm fully expecting the transaction to take less than 30 seconds between the first time they say their name to the time you hand them their authorization to vote to go get their ballot. Okay? So I'm going to use that same SMI search because it's easy for me. And I'm going to vote Albert Henry Smith. Okay, because number one, he's in my precinct as identified by the highlighted Cleveland East. So you bring up the voter and you verify all of their information. And remarkably, I have pulled up a have a check voter. That is unbelievable to me, which is fine. And I'm actually going to just, <laughs> I'm going to go back a second because it just threw me for a little bit of a loop. Because I wanted to explain to you about voter ID. We do not have to show voter ID this election. Voters will not be required to show voter ID except for a very select few voters that have registered and their identification they provided, either a social security number or their driver's license, did not validate in our system for some reason. So they've been informed that they have to bring a certain piece of identification to the polling place in order to work. They've already been informed to bring that, so they should have that documentation with them. And what you're going to do is you're going to look at the address to verify the address is the same as on their voter record. That's all you need to do for that. So, And in that case, that would be this Mr. Albert Smith. He's one of the gentlemen that has to show ID. So I'll show you that example right now. So you'll see the voter and you won't even necessarily notice that red check mark. It says Hava address check and that's what we are. We're going to address check this person. By clicking the word yes, the system is going to tell you that this voter is required to show a valid form of identification. This voter has been informed prior to them being in front of you that they should bring this identification. So basically, they'll have to show you one of these forms of identification. It's a rather robust list, but you're not looking at the picture. You're looking at the address on the bank statement, the government check, the driver's license, whatever they show you. Okay, so I'll have to show the form of ID, so I'll just select what form, and he sent a paycheck. I click OK, and now I can continue on. And if you'll notice, I have a blue check mark. And now is everything correct with this voter? And it actually is. So I click yes. And the f another one of the many pieces of paper that's going to print for this voter. And that's the authorization to vote. This is the authorization to vote right here. This should be signed by the voter after they read it. It's important that you have the voters read this paper that we hand them to verify the information is correct. It's a rare situation to have a voter in front of an election official to get accurate and correct updated information. So make sure they read it. But they will have to sign the bottom of it. You'll have to sign it as well. 
and then hand it back to the voter and they'll walk over to the ballot table. The ballot folks will annotate the number of voters, you know, the number, and they'll hand them the ballot and they'll keep moving on. So hopefully that's the transaction that you'll see for the most part. Is somebody will come in, they'll identify themselves, and by the way, you never you never tell them the address on the screen. They always have to tell you. State your name, state your address. Don't ever say, are you John Smith at, you know, Hobgood Lane? You don't say it. They have to tell you, okay? Also, I want to show you Mr. Mr. Henry, uh, Henry, Albert Henry Smith that we just actually voted. If you'll notice now, the system has assigned a V on his record. That means he's already voted, okay? And if he would have come back in to vote, if we select his record, the system is going to tell you as well. So again, I mentioned the E, the A, and the V on a voter record. Now, if a voter comes in looking, wondering if they voted, you can easily determine that on this screen. Find the voter. If you see a red A, E, or V, you can tell them that they've voted already in this election. Okay? Okay, we also have the capability to update or find somebody by street address. Street address is a great system. We have a great system here because my system is always going to make a suggestion to you based on where you are in putting the address in the system. So by taking your time with a street address, you'll save a lot of time because my system will make a suggestion to you with every keystroke. Okay? So basically, when you start typing an address, or you'll see there'll be a suggestion window that'll pop up. So I'm going to find 39 Mac Lane. Okay, in Newton Grove, I typed in three characters and I have the address I'm looking for. It saves you a lot of time when you're doing your, and we have no voters there. That's surprising. But anyway, so take your time with the street address. Okay. So now, what we're going to do now is we're going to find a voter and we're going to update their address. Okay, so we're going to move somebody into the precinct. Okay, I'm going to pull up this Adam... Adam Smith person, we're going to change his address, okay? Now, on election day, you can change somebody's name, or you can change their address or their P.O. box. You cannot change their date of birth, their gender. <laughs> you have to do that through a, or their party, actually. They would have to do that from a voter registration form that will be available at the precinct if they need to make that kind of a change. But on election day, you can update somebody's name or their address. Now understand, when you update somebody's address, there's a good chance they're going to move their precinct. So that may, that may mean they're not in the right precinct or they're now in the wrong precinct or something like that. So be wary of this. In fact, if you'll notice, this Adam Smith is in the Turkey precinct up at the top. Well, we're in the Clinton East precinct, so we're going to move him into that precinct. So Mr. Smith has informed me that they have moved. Now, if you'll notice on the right side there, there is the name and address change button. So you click that, and these are the address that you can change. Okay? So basically, we're going to update this guy's address. Okay? And he lives now at 712 College Street. So by typing very, very slowly in five characters, I now have College Street in my list. So I click and select that, and it takes all of the information. The city, state, and zip is automatic. So it saves you a lot of time. So slowly type in. Every time you hit a keystroke, look up. Okay? Now, if you notice, there's also a mailing address, which I'm sure his Clinton, his turkey address, P.O. box, will not be available in Clinton. Could be, but certainly, if you see anybody with a mailing address, verify that's still being used. If not, just hit the clear button, and we will remove it. And also, now this button will reflect the correct date, but you'll need to verify if that person has lived there for more than 30 days. It's North Carolina state law that you have to be at an address for 60 day, 30 days in order to eligibly vote at that location. So we're going to need you to ask the voter if they have lived there prior to October 4th or after October 4th. So what was the date? I will update this button to reflect that accordingly. But in this case, they've been there much before February 2nd, so I update their address. Now this is telling you, this, this screen, 
And by the way, the address form is printing. And this is the form that the voters should review and then sign in this big box here. Okay? And this verifies the address, and that'll give us the capability. And this goes in the EVID folder. But this is telling us that this folk had moved from Turkey over to Cleveland, uh, Clinton East. And you need to contact that old voter's precinct. That number should be called. That is the cell phone for the chief judge at the Turkey precinct. You just have to have them verify or ask, has Mr. Smith actually voted in this election? If they say no, he has not, by looking them up on their EVID machine, they should mark that voter as transferred because you're going to be able to vote them here. But by marking them as transferred, this voter can't leave this precinct, go back to their old precinct, tell them they didn't move, and vote a second time. We don't want that to happen. So that's why you want this precinct to tell the old precinct that that voter moved to my precinct, if that makes sense. So I'm going to say we contacted this voter, and we were able to vote an authorization to vote. And now prints the authorization to vote with the updated voter's information. Okay. The voter signs it, you sign it and get them on their merry way over to the ballot table. Okay, you will have pre uh, you'll have voters that come in that are in a different precinct. And I just did a quick search. Now, if you'll notice, I'm going to pull up Gladys Smiling, and if you'll notice, she's in Clinton Southwest Precinct. Okay, everything is correct with her information. When I click yes, the system is going to tell you that this voter is at the incorrect precinct. They're supposed to be at the Clinton Fire Station. And I want to do a process, or I want you to do a process when you're asking this question. I want you to start nodding your head up and down and say, would you like a referral to your correct precinct? Just keep nodding your head because it may suggestively tell the voter that, yes, I need to go to my correct polling place. We want everybody to vote at their correct polling place. The ballot that the staff at the Board of Elections has provided is waiting for them at their correct precinct. We're not intending them to waste gas. We want them to be at their correct precinct. Please recommend that they go because their ballot is sitting there because if they're in the wrong precinct, I will be able to give them a provisional ballot, but it won't be their ballot. Okay, so a referral is just as quick and easy as that button. What this will provide to you is a document to give that voter the referral form, it says at the bottom, give to voter, have them take it to their precinct, and it has the address and some directions on how to get there. But with GPS, they can just put the address, and this will enable them to get to their correct precinct. So basically, you can find that information on any voter in, in Sampson County by looking them up in EBIT. You'll be able to determine where they're supposed to go to vote. Now, if they don't have time to go, if they have to, you know, it's late or whatever, I only have an hour for lunch or whatever, they can vote a provisional, and we'll go through that, that process in a minute. But I want to recommend that we, provisionals should be offered to everybody, but we want to try to limit the amount of provisionals because they're fail-safe voting and should only be kind of used in an emergency situation, like if they're in the wrong precinct or something of that nature. But you can easily do it through my system, okay? So I'm going to find a voter, and this is a voter that's out of precinct. In fact, I'll bring up Gladys again. And she's out of precinct, and the system will tell me that they're out of precinct. There we go. And no, I can't go to the other precinct. It's late. I have to vote here. Okay, well, you're going to have to vote a provisional. So by clicking this button, you have to tell this voter, listen, we're going to vote you here, but we do not have your correct ballot style in this precinct. I'm going to need to select a ballot style to give you, but it won't be your actual correct ballot style. Okay? So by clicking OK, I'll say that the voter is in the correct precinct. I click the select ballot style, and these are the ballot styles. Wow! There are five, six ballot styles at Clinton East? Okay. Well, again, this voter, he's going to be getting not the correct ballot style because it's in his precinct where it should be. So basically, we'll select one of these ballot styles, and we'll provide that to the voter. 
by clicking yes and the documentation will print. It's important that you tell a voter that I will give you a ballot, but your correct ballot is going to be at your correct precinct. But this is the documentation. The first is the provisional form, which will be handed to the voter. They'll take to the provisional desk. There is some additional information the voter will need to update, but that'll be handled by the provisional desk. This secondary piece of paper, which should be with the first one, basically will tell Naya and the staff the precinct information that the voter should have been at. And the last sheet that's printing is called the voter call-in sheet, which will be handed to the voter so they can find out the disposition of their provisional ballot. But all three forms should get handed to the voter and taken over to the provisional desk for processing. Okay. What else can we talk about? Uh, again, we've pretty much done what I would consider about 95% of your voter activity. You're going to have the right voter in the right precinct. Oh, okay, the absentee. Do we have absentee voters in the system? Okay, let me see if I can find one. I just found one. I just found one. Okay, the absentee folks. Okay, I just wanted to show you. This is another example of the letter V, the letter E, or the letter A, which means this person has returned their absentee ballot. Okay, you can easily tell somebody by that. There's the absentee flag, and you could see that on their record here. That means that Ali Smith has returned their absentee ballot and it's been accepted by the office. This person would not be eligible to vote on election day and the system will tell you that. So that's what the absentee flag is, is all about. Okay. Um, we can certainly search by street address, but the rarest of situations is when you get this message that no voters, no matter what you've done, you've tried to find by voter name, you've tried to find by date of birth, You've tried to find them by street address. I would then suggest you may want to call the office to do a final determination if this voter is actually registered in the system. It could be a different, it could be registered under a, a unique name or I had one uh, poll worker, his, his name was Billy Ray and he couldn't find himself in the system and he was upset because he was registered as William. So that was why we didn't find him because we, he was typing in Billy instead of William. So. But if you get this message and you can't find the voter, we can do the process of what they call cannot find voter in the system, which is basically to do a provisional ballot for that voter. Okay? And that's, and that's the most time-consuming process that EVA does because it's going to take some correspondence and discussion between you and the voter to complete the application. Okay? So if you can't find the voter, you're going to click that cannot find voter button, and it's going to state to you that this voter's registration is not available. The voter, if they wish to vote today, they're going to have to vote a provisional. Do you want to continue? If they say yes, then you'll continue. Now, I want to briefly explain this screen. This is a screen where we want you to ask that voter where and when do they think they registered to vote. More than likely, they're going to say they thought they registered at the DMV, but if they did any of the other, if they mailed it in, if they went to the BOE, if, even if they said they did not register, but certainly the DMV. But we want you to ask them where and when they think they registered. Most folks will say they tried it at the DMV, like I said. So we need to ask you to ask them, when do you think you were at the DMV? Uh, let's see, I think it was in the middle of January. Okay, doesn't have to be an exact date but I would like to get some approximate date on when they thought they would have registered because Naya and the staff needs to report this information to the state board to help the DMV find out where they had the problem. But you will need to record the driver's license number for that voter because that report needs to be provided from the county to the state to investigate why the DMV record didn't get processed properly. Okay. Here you, you, you click continue, and this is where you're going to have the conversation to get the information from the voter. Are they a U.S. citizen? 
Are they going to be 18 before election day? Okay. You'll then put the date of birth in for the voter. And I'll put myself in. 1959. Okay. And you'll type in. You'll need to type in the name. Oh, I typed it wrong, but... And let me close this calculator here. I don't know what happened there. Okay, Gerard. Okay, Jay. And Smith is my last name. Now, I do have a, a, a junior, and that's where you would select the suffix. Just select junior as the suffix. Click OK. And this is where I'm going to type in the address, the residential address. And I'm going to take my time. 712 College CO. If you'll notice, it's the third one down on the list. So by typing five characters, I can complete this address in five keystrokes. So I click that. If you hit the tab button, it'll fill in a proper city, state, and zip. The unit number, if necessary, I just need the number or the letter. I don't need an APT or a unit number. I just need the number or the letter designation for that apartment or lot or what have you. Okay. If they have a mailing address, you'll need to type that in. I do not make suggestions on mailing addresses. It should be in the, in the format, if it's a P.O. Box, P.O. Box 1234, Turkey, comma, North Carolina with the zip code. But you will need to complete that information free form. I don't make suggestions for that. Okay? So once you update that, you hit the continue button. But again, you need to remind yourself to ask the voter where and when did they move. It has to be 30 days. So if it was before October 4th or after October 4th. Okay, in this case, I'm going to say it was before. And I click continue. Now, this is where you need to get some demographic information like the gender. Make sure you ask the question. It's usually not as apparent as you think as far as somebody's gender. So I'll be a male. Okay, you'll need to select their state of birth. It's an alphabetical list. North Carolina is at the top. Okay, you select that. We're going to need their party, obviously, and in order to register. If they don't select the party, they will be unaffiliated, but in this case, I'm going to select Democrat. Okay, ethnicity can be recorded if possible. If not, it would be undesignated. And we'll do the Hispanic, non-Hispanic Latino, and we'll put the race down, and it's myself, and I'll put myself down. Now, it's telling me to select the ballot style. Now, based on the address that I put in, my system is going to make a suggestion to you that this is the ballot style that you should give that voter. Now, if it's an out-of-precinct voter, you won't have that ballot style. But if it is an in-precinct voter, you're going to give them this specific ballot style. So when you select that button, you'll see a list. And, oh, guess what? My ballot style 8 is right here. So I select that and I make sure that I have the assigned ballot style and the provided ballot style are one and the same. Okay, everything looks good. You hit continue and now you can review all of your information with the voter in case there's any questions. As soon as you complete the review, you hit the word continue and all of the provisional paperwork is now printing. The stuff should be handed to the voter and they will take this over, ooh, over to the provisional table. Okay. Any questions? <laughs> I've pretty much done basically all the different scenarios you, you're probably going to run into. There may be one or two that you may or may not run into, but there will be a provided user guide at each precinct. Uh, if you have questions on anything, certainly call the office. They have good information on how to help you through this. Um, the system will hum all day long. I don't expect any problems. You'll always get back to this menu. I talked about having the proper user if you're operating the machine. In order to change users, you just have to go back to the main menu, okay, and hit operator sign on. And this is where you'll update your uh, initials. So I'll put Parker Holland. Uh, okay, and the password is EVID. Okay, now another piece of paper is going to print. It's similar to that opening report when you change operators. Not a problem, does not need to be signed, 
but you're not going to throw it out. I would put them with the other ones, okay? But this is kind of, this is what prints when you change operators. Just save that piece of paper. Also, I mentioned that there's some reports available too. Yes, these are some of the reports that you could look at during the day. If you want to view the last thing that you did on this machine, you can view the last check-in. Okay, if you want to look at everything that was done, you can look at all of the check-ins. Okay, you can look at your curbside, you can look at your provisionals, you can look at all your folks. And these are the folks that we've actually taken care of today. Now, are you providing lists to your runners when they come in or observers when they... Upon request. Okay. If somebody comes in, an observer, and they're looking for the folks that have participated in the election, there is a report. It's called the midday report. It can be run at any time, but it's called the midday report. And this will provide you a very quick, brief list of all the folks that have voted at that precinct to the time you run the report. It's public record. You're not providing this person anything that's not available publicly, but you can print it. So you just click the button. And yes, and it will now print that report, which will have everybody that actually voted, and you can hand this to that person requesting. Now understand that this report at the end of the day could be rather large, <laughs> so be selective on who you provide this to, okay? Because if there's four or five hundred folks, it could be a few pages, and we don't want to kill trees, okay? Um, I think we've pretty much done everything that we're going to need to work on. Um, again, the three-character method, I just want you to be very familiar with that and use that to find voters in the system. You'll limit your search, you'll bring back correct voters, and especially with the mass, it's more difficult to understand what people are talking about. Okay, you'll be working all day on this, you'll change in users at the end of the night, at 7.30 or whenever the end of the night happens to be there is a brief close down procedure that you'll need to go through and that's from the main menu. So you go back to the main menu and you click the exit button. You'll confirm your shutdown and the final of all the pieces of paper that are printed is going to print. It's called the report of votes cast. Very important report for the balancing of the precinct numbers. Okay, this needs to be printed from both machines and those precincts that have the two and it should have the exact same information. This gets signed by the judges, and this will help them with their reconciliation. Also, this activator that has been used in this machine needs to be removed, and this needs to be given back to the chief judge, and this has to come back to the office at the end of the election day. Now, as far as the computer, you can pretty much just close it down just like this, pack everything up, and you'll be good to go. If you have any questions, certainly the office will be available. And we'll have folks on call if you have any need on Election Day. But thank you. So, so now that Jerry's talked about EVID, let's talk about the help station. The help station is the location for private discussion with voters about irregular situations. A voter may be sent to the station if there's an issue with the voter registration or if the voter is un otherwise unable to receive a regular ballot. Provisional voting or, pre or precinct transfers are typically handled at the help station. Remember at your provisional station that you must have a poll booth. You must include a canvas date and sign. Now, there are many reasons a voter might present to the help station. Voters presenting to the help station should do so with the help referral form from the check-in station. The most common process that will happen at the help station is assisting a voter with casting a provisional ballot. Another resolution at the help st station may be the transfer another transfer a voter to another precinct and vote a regular ballot or again a provisional ballot. Let's go over briefly the provisional voter reasons. A voter does not have an acceptable HAVA ID. There is no record of registration. There is an unreported move. There is a previously removed voter. There is an unrecognized address. And as Jerry showed us, that a voter has shown up at an incorrect precinct, and there are other reasons as well. You have the provisional voting process. You're going to accept the referral form from the voter. You're going to complete the provisional poll book. You're going to complete the administrative section of the provisional voting application. 
you're going to uh, write on the poll book log the pen labels, the provisional application, and make sure you have the instructions. You're going to ask the voter to complete and sign the provisional voter application. You're going to accept and review all forms with the voter, sign or initial where needed. You're going to obtain the proper ballot and write the word provisional and the precinct number of the voter's eligible, eligible precinct on the ballot. Present the voter with the ballot, the provisional application, the envelope with the instructions. Then you're going to provide the voter with verbal instructions on the voting uh, ballot, have them vote in private, placing the voted ballot in the envelope, and returning the voted ballot sealed in the provisional envelope. If applicable, provide the voter with verbal instructions on time for providing the County Board of Elections with ID, uh, acceptable ID under HAVA. I cannot stress this enough. Please do not let any ballots that are provisionals be placed into the tabulator. It creates a lot of work on NIA and the staff. Let's talk a little bit about this application. This application for a provisional voter is also a voter registration application. It must indicate the reason the voter is voting provisionally. Um, it actually, there's a new form that has more descriptions of this. And please, please, please make sure that the voter signs the application. And again, make sure, <coughs> excuse me, make sure the election official signs the application as well. If a voter has gone to the DMV, and please ensure that person indicates that they are registered, if they say they registered the DMV, you select the DMV reason on the application. Again, and it's highlighted in blue on this form, please make sure the voter signs it and that you, the election official, initials it. If a person says, again, that they registered the DMV, please mark the box and have them uh, write the date and include their uh, driver's license number. Again, we cannot stress this enough as we have a process in which we can search for DMV registrations to confirm that the voter attempted to register there. On the top of your provisional ballot, excuse me, the provisional ballot notation should include the word provisional or PROV in the precinct where the voter should be voting. If you have a voter who is unable or refuses to go to their correct precinct, like Jerry was talking about earlier, you would put the number or of the correct precinct where the voter should be voting. If you have a voter who is voting in the correct precinct, but are voting provisionally due to some other issue, you can't find the registration or they're a first-time voter who needs to show a HAVA ID and does not have a source with them, that number would be the precinct in which you're working. Trifold the ballot before putting in the provisional envelope and hand the opened envelope with the ballot inside to the voter. Instruct the voter to go to the provisional poll booth and complete the ballot and place it back in the envelope and seal the ballot uh, inside that envelope. Nothing other than the ballot should be inside the provisional envelope. Research is done to determine the status of that ballot and will be based on the information that the provisional application has and any other information provided um, to the officials should be placed in the exterior sleeve. Again, please do not let that ballot go into the tabulator. Completing the envelope. You're going to write the PIN number on the application in the top box where it says PIN label. You're going to complete the following information the voter's name, the poll book number. This should match the line on the poll book such as CEN-000-1, the voting precinct where the voter should vote on election day, and the ballot style issued. This must match the ballot you gave the voter and that's on the provisional application. Completing the poll book. On the line associated with the poll book, number of the voter, you will write the voter's name and address, ballot style issued, and the PIN number. Again, this information is found on the provisional application and on the back of the envelope. The provisional voter instructions. The election official will also need to provide the voter with provisional instructions. Inform the voter that, they, that he or she may check the status of his or her provisional ballot no earlier than 10 days before the election. Make sure that you direct the voter to his or her PIN number. 
and make sure that they're aware um, that they can call the County Board of Elections uh, or email them with information if it is required. You want to make sure that you provide the voter with the provisional voting and reason, the PIN number, a reason about the HAVA ID, and the county day of canvas. This is, will go over how to cure any issues that requires follow-up, including the date by which it must be done. You will return the provisional poll book and completed provisional envelopes on election night. The, numbers vote, the number of voters listed on your provisional poll book should match the number of provisional applications. Let's talk about voter assistance. Questions about your absentee ballot content, or about the ballot content, excuse me. You may only provide technical advice on how to complete a ballot. You cannot provide any information or advice on any contest, candidates, or referenda on the ballot no opinions, interpretations, or paraphrases of ballot items. Each polling site uh, will, have a, will have information to provide to voters such as a sample ballot. Please, if you are asked to read a ballot, read every voter's, or excuse me, every candidate's name in the same tone of voice, and please do not provide any inflections uh, on any candidate's names to indicate whether you are supporting or not supporting them. Uh, something very, very important that you'll need to remember when providing assistance. Service animals. This is something that's very important uh, because some voters may have service animals and bring them to the polling locations. ADA law, or Americans with Disability Act, requires that service animals are allowed in any polling location. The, polling, uh, the ADA requirement is limited to service animals and not comfort animals. The service animal may wear a vest, harness, or display an ID, but this is not required. You may not ask the handler about the nature of his or her disability. You may ask, is that a service animal and what has the animal been trained to do? Please do not ask if you can pet the service animal. Uh, most often it's a dog, and I have to be honest, I struggle with that because I always want to pet dogs. But please do not do that. Um, those dogs are, or a service animal of any type are working, and they are not to be distracted. Let's talk about the exit station. If you're working at the exit station or, at the ta or, or also known as a machine monitor or a tabulator monitor, Remain close enough to hear any tabulator alerts, but not close enough to see a voter's choice. This is one of the things we get more complaints about at the State Board of Elections than anything else. Understand alerts and how to address them, and this is probably the third or fourth time you've heard me say this, so I cannot emphasize this enough. Ensure no provisional ballots enter the tabulator. The exit station attendant should know to direct the voter to the ballot station if they would like to spool their ballot due to unintended selections or if they have a concern that they were given the wrong ballot. And as you can see, it's being highlighted. Something you may want to ask a voter is have you carefully reviewed each selection on your ballot? Once that ballot goes into the tabulator, the voter has cast their ballot and cannot receive another one. Let's talk about closing in po the polls. At 7.30, the chief judge or judge will announce the polls are now closed. And you will probably be very happy as we all know that election day is an extremely long day. Voters in, time, uh, voters in line at 7.30, remember before time to close the polls, send a person to the back of the line so that way you know uh, who the last person in line is. At 7.30, you'll begin taking names starting at the back of the line. At the front of the line, give the list to the check-in station. The first person on the list will be the last eligible voter. And do not begin packing up signs until the polls have closed. Remember, in counting the ballots at the end of the night, you'll have the emergency ballot bin. Make sure that the emergency ballot bin, should you've had to use it throughout the day, that the ballots have been fed through the tabulator. Make sure you remove the ballots from the bin and it's secured. Always, always have a bipartisan team when handling ballots. Also, please make sure that if you have observers watching the closing process, or you have observers, 
make sure any any observers or voters always announce what you're doing it'll make them feel better and it will help increase transparency in the process on the tabulator um, or the ds200 you'll close the polls uh, using your bipartisan team of judges um, there's actually a button in the ds200 which you'll hit to that will say close polls it's pretty pretty self-explanatory um, there are only two buttons in there it's a power button and a close poll button so remember that at the end of the night you want to close the polls the closing tape and the zero tape should remain attached from the morning all judges will sign these tapes you want to seal the tape with media in a secure return container and a second tape will print which the judges will sign and you can place an envelope place in an envelope which will be dropped into a postal box by the judge that is just used in case uh, something happens during transportation. You have the reconciliation, the ballot chain of custody. This accounts for received ballots, voted ballots, spooled ballots, provisional ballots, emergency bin ballots, challenged and unvoted ballots. Please make sure this is filled out correctly. On election night, please make sure that you receive the thumb drive from the DS200, the results tape connected with the zero tape, your DS200 keys and your Automark keys. And although it's not listed, Jerry talked about this as well, make sure you bring your activators back to the Board of Elections. Otherwise, they will send you to find them. So please make sure you have them. And guess what? We have a checklist for this as well as it popped up on the screen. If in, if in doubt, always check your checklist. We cannot stress that enough. Your election night returns, you have the ATVs in a sealed bag, voted ballots in a cardboard box, spooled ballots in a sealed bag. Um, you have also your return, your unused ballots in an out stack um, of write-ins in a sealed bag. You have your supply return checklist. Be prepared for the return process to take a bit longer than usual this year as we are gonna be social distance. Um, we appreciate your service so much and we'll work as best as we can to be efficient so that you can get home quickly as we know it is an extremely long day. Let's briefly go over some emergency procedures and election day emergencies. The, one of the biggest things that we can stress is to be prepared. If you lose electricity, tabulators will continue on battery power. I think it's about a four hour backup and at that time you'll use the emergency bin. Your laptops will continue on battery power and you can hand write on your ATVs or go to labels as long as you can verify the voters who, are, who they are who they say they are. Uh, but when in doubt the power goes out, always use your labels. You will want to contact the Board of Elections immediately. If you have to evacuate um, before the day begins, um, designate a meeting location. Designate who is responsible for getting the equipment, the ballots, and the ATVs. If there's a serious emergency, remember to get to a safe place, call 911, and please call the Board of Elections. Um, and then we actually have a nice checklist for you to designate who's responsible for what in an emergency. There are some special requirements in case of a delay of voting. Ideally, there would never be a delay. However, um, if there is and voters want to leave, please get their contact information and call the county office immediately. In most cases, there are ways to continue voting even if you are locked out, if the power goes off, etc. However, if your chief judge does not arrive with the ballots or if for any reason there's a delay in voting, please ensure that you get the, get the contact information of voters and call the office immediately, even if they say they will come back. Please get all this information. This type of event could require a new election if not handled correctly. So here in Sampson County, we use the electronic registration list or poll book known as EVID, as Jerry trained you on. Please make sure that you have the paper plan ready to go. You'll have the ATVs, uh, blank ATVs, a printed poll book, and ATV, or excuse me, help referral forms at the check-in station. At the help station, you'll have blank provisional applications, pen labels, and pre-printed provisional voting instructions. 
Now let's talk a little bit about security. Only voters in the act of voting are allowed inside the voting enclosure. If a person says they are an observer, check your list to make sure that they are who they say they are. Do not attach any outside media device to your laptop or tabulator. Cannot stress that enough and please make sure that you're not connecting any devices to the internet as well. You want to keep your balance um, neat and secured and report any missing ballots, laptops, or media storage devices. And also, use your incident report should anything occur. Last but not least in training, we're going to talk about COVID-19 and the pandemic and what it means to elections. We're doing things before voting begins, we're during, doing things during the voting process, and we're doing things after the voting locations close. Before and during, it is recommended that election workers self-screen for a fever and symptoms prior to working according to CDC guidelines. High touch areas and voting equipment must be disinfected and sanitized throughout the day. Election workers should wash their hands or use sanitizer if they're not uh, frequently after removing gloves or especially if they're not wearing gloves. Workers should be assigned for interior and exterior line control, door control, and sanitizing duties. Please make sure that your polling places are arranged to ensure social distancing. Uh, social distancing marks will be used throughout the voting place. Now, I voted stickers will not be shared this election. I know that that is something that upsets a lot of voters, but we actually have pins this year that say I voted in the 2020 elections. Uh, these pins are to be given to the voters and to be kept uh, by them. We do not want to share pins this year. Uh, again, you want to digitally, uh, diligently implement safety practices. Sick workers must stay home. We know that you all are extremely dedicated to the voting process, and that is what makes elections amazing. However, if you are sick, please stay home. Do not risk getting only yourself, uh, yourself sicker, but also your friends and neighbors and fellow workers. Workers, again, should self-screen for a fever and symptoms prior to work. If workers should report to the supervisors, uh, they should report to the supervisors if they get sick during the shift. Um, Anyone who's experiencing shortness of breath or an inability to stand on their own should be cared for immediately by calling 911 and reporting a suspect COVID-19 case with severe system, uh, symptoms. Again, six feet social distancing should be posted throughout the voting place. Please make sure you're wearing your mask. Uh, you should be using PPE equipment. And remember, although we're required to wear masks, voters are not you can encourage them to do so by asking them to please wear a mask. If they do not want to, there's not a whole lot we can do after that, but always make the offer. Uh, make sure you're disinfecting and cleaning workspaces before and after interactions with voters and using materials. Um, use caution when you're handling the ballots. We're gonna provide the following for you all. Masks for all poll workers and voters who did not bring them, face shields and gloves, Single-use pens, again, um, they're for the voters to keep. They're pretty nice. We actually have some up here at the office. Um, Single-use cotton swabs for those using touchscreen voting machines. Hand sanitizer, protective barriers, and please remember that PPE can be disposed of as regular trash. High-touch high surfaces will be sanitized throughout the day. Uh, these items are listed on the uh, slide, but just as a reminder, these are tables, doorknobs, phones, and keyboards, as well as other items. Cleaning, disinfecting, and sanitizing. A worker is to disinfect and sanitize all high-touch areas between voters. A, vo a worker is uh, to disinfect and sanitize voting equipment in accordance with the manufacturer recommendations. Your greeters and door monitors should offer masks to voters who do not bring their own while maintaining a safe distance, provide hand sanitizers to voters before and after, and again, assure the six feet distance is encouraged before the next voter um, enters the voting enclosure. At the check-in station, uh, since the voter will need to come closer than the six feet recommended distance to sign documents, 
make sure that you offer hand sanitizer and give documents to the voters and make sure that the PPE, the mask, the face shield, and or gloves are always on. At the help station, um, you're going to maintain the social distance as well. Encourage voters to keep their pens. Please, 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 I about said please pens. Please do not share the pens. Again, pay special attention to keeping six feet away and encourage voters to uh, follow one-way directional signs. Curbside voting. We want you to maintain a safe distance from voters. Approach the vehicle and provide hand sanitizer to voters before and after voting. Use precaution when handling the ballots. Sanitize the privacy folders and clipboards. And again, encourage voters to discard or keep their pens. As always, your mask, face shield, and gloves should be on. After the voting locations close, voting locations must be cleaned and sanitized. Equipment must be thoroughly disinfected during and after packing, and voting locations must be returned to their pre-election condition. Again, I want to say thank you for ensuring that North Carolina voters exercise their right to vote without fear of disease when casting their ballot. And thank you again for your commitment to the elections process and to the voters of Sampson County.